much. Um, hi, I'm sorry, I probably I should apologize as well that my, I'm not obviously speaking German, and I don't even have the excuse of being Dutch. If my German teacher was here today, I can almost picture him in the front row looking ashamed of me. Um, and ironically, over the next 40 minutes, I want to talk about some of the ways in which we as cultural institutions engage with the world around us. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done at the National Archives and some of the things that we still need to do. Um, one of the titles of this conference was, was something like um, Vision and Taboo, and I hope um, I, can, I can do both in the course of this, um, this talk. Um, I'd like to start where I think we can all agree more archival stories ought to begin, namely in outer space. So right now, about a thousand kilometers above our heads is Prospero, which is the only satellite sent into space by British rocket technology. And in 1971, Britain led the world uh, in space research by being the first and only country in the world to develop the capability to put satellites into space and then deciding to not do that ever again. Um, but Prospero is, is still up there and it's orbiting the Earth about every 104 minutes and it's done that for 40 years. And last year, a team from the Mullard Space Laboratory in Surrey uh, decided that they would attempt to contact Prospero to see if it was still functioning. And there was only one problem, and that was that no one could remember the codes that they needed to talk to it. But those codes did still exist. They were in technical files from the original project held at the National Archives. And armed with these records and um, an armful of technology, the Prospero project had everything they needed to open communication with the satellite, and I'll come back to them later on. But this is also the position that we in archives and libraries and museums and galleries, and that's a mouthful, so I'll just say cultural organizations from now on, are in. We've got armfuls of technology, but do we know what to do with it? There are some suggestions that we don't, or that we're only just starting to understand. In 1999, the writer Douglas Adams said that we didn't know what the internet was yet. He said, we mistake it for a type of publishing or broadcasting because that's what we're used to. And then he casually mentioned what he thought the internet might be in four words. He said, it's just people talking. Now, back in 1999, there's no question that we as cultural organizations thought that the internet was a type of publishing. The question is, now, 13 years later, what have we done to prove that we know we were wrong? Because it seems to me that most of what we do online is still focused around the idea of publishing content in a frankly very old-fashioned way. We've never admitted that we were wrong about the internet just being a place to put stuff. And because we've never admitted it, we've never really seriously revisited what being online is for. Because Doug if Douglas Adams is right, and the internet is for talking, then that means that we're largely misdirecting our resources. And how far, after all, has publishing got us? You know, what we've got to show for the last 10 years is a lot of digitized content, but we could have said that 10 years ago. I think we have to accept that, certainly in my own country at least, we failed to deliver, for example, a step change in the way that teachers interact with cultural content. We failed to deliver a step change in the way that students interact with cultural content. And frankly, many academics are still working in much the same way that they used to. But we've built a lot of websites, and that's, that's great, isn't it? Well, outside of our sector, not everybody's that impressed with our websites. Last year, a leading software developer in New Zealand, Nathan Talkington, gave a talk to the National and State Librarians of Australia, and he wasn't very polite. He told them that they provided crap access to their collections online, and he described their flagship digital initiatives like this. He said, but then if I look at the results of those digitization projects, these are his words, not mine, I find the shittiest websites on the planet. It's like a gallery spent all its money buying art and then just stuck the paintings in supermarket bags and lent them against the wall. Now, that's very harsh. But I think to some extent he's right. For instance, in terms of archives, where's our expertise online? We very often just leave users to sink us or swim in a morass of our content. We don't do that when people come into our buildings, but we're doing it on the web. 
we're not meeting the needs of our users. And I think one of the main reasons we're not is because we're, we're not open enough. We're not open in the way that we interact with our users, and we're not open about the data that we publish. And by the way, just because you publish something online and slap a Creative Commons license on it, that doesn't make it open. I mean, legally it does, obviously, but it doesn't make it intellectually accessible. One of the paradoxes of linked data, which was mentioned earlier, according to Tim Berners-Lee, this is the most open form of data, this five-star data. The irony of linked data is that even many developers don't really understand the technology of RDF and triple stores, and when confronted with it, they say, oh, couldn't we just have a CSV file? We need to explain our data as we would explain a painting in our collection or a historic building. It doesn't speak for itself to a non-specialist any more than a 5,000-year-old pot shard does. And we're hopeless at that at the moment because we're too busy throwing information overboard like we're in a hot air balloon and it's plummeting to earth. And all these websites are also dreadfully expensive. In 2009, a consortium of major UK museums and galleries spent one and three quarter million pounds on a website called Creative Spaces, and today that website no longer exists. That money might as well have been fired into space on a rocket. And yet, when it comes to digital engagement, to working with enthusiastic user communities on the web, people are absurdly cautious, it seems to me. Here's something else that Douglas Adams said. He said, there's no them out there uh, on the internet. It's just an awful lot of us. And that's one of the things to remember when we talk about crowdsourcing. We are the crowd. They are us. We're the audience. We're the users. And that means that when we come to ask questions about crowdsourcing, it means we, we know both the questions and the answers. What is the internet? Well, it's for talking. But it's not a talking shop. It's a workshop. It's a place where things can be built and made and created, and that might be art, literature, and storytelling, or it might be a data visualization or a blog. If we can't work with people to create those things, it might not be them that are the problem, it might be us. Our documents and our artifacts are and have always been the building blocks for historians, but now that they're available online, other people want to play with them. They want to play with our toys. That ought to be incredibly exciting, but instead we worry that if we share with the other children, our toys might get broken. And here's the thing, I don't want to sound naive or utopian, but you know, they're, they're not our toys. They belong to everybody. What should we do about that? Well, we can make it much easier for people to get the access they want to our content, and we can't worry about whether some spaces are legitimate for us to work in or not. How far should our reach extend? In the real world, are there communities that we don't want to engage with? Maybe a few, but not, not very many for most of us. So why should it be different online? Let's, let's talk about Wikipedia. Um, so there's an article there about Anthony Eden, one of Britain's least successful prime ministers, illustrated with a, a, an image from the collections, uh, the National Archives. Um, now, Lennart yesterday talked about some of the rationales for working with Wikipedia. Here was my first rationale. It's the world's fifth biggest website, and the other four won't return my calls. Although now I've met Amit, maybe that's going to change. As cultural institutions, it's a very simple question. Do we want to talk to people online? Do we want to work in the places in which they're working? Or do we not bother? Because it seems to me that if we don't want to use Wikipedia and social media and other sorts of popular online tools that people use, then we might as well say, well, this internet business I'm not sure it's really for me. Here's a major misconception about Wikipedia that's ironically shared by many of its users, none in the room today, I'm sure, but most people think of Wikipedia as a place that they go to find things out. But it isn't that. Wikipedia is a place where people inform each other. Wikipedia is the most social website that isn't actually a social network. And if embracing open data is how we join that conversation, then embrace it we must. Because if the sign reads, kind hemped, kind sure, kind service, then you need to wear a shirt. I didn't follow that advice today, but it's, it's good advice. You get the idea. 
we've got a big advantage in Britain, and you have it here in Germany too, in the shape of Wikimedia Deutschland. They're very enthusiastic about what they do, they're very well organized, they're well funded, and they want to share their expertise. What's important is that everybody manages their expectations. So here are some, um, in the absence of David Ferriero. In October last year, documents from the National Archives in Washington, NARA documents, got 70 million views on Wikipedia, and that's six times as much traffic as their website gets in an entire year. Six times as much traffic in a month as their website gets in a year. For the National Archives in the UK, where we've barely started this work, the numbers are already about two million a month. And that, if you don't know how to measure those statistics, have a chat with me afterwards, it's very straightforward. Our collaboration with WikiAfrica, which is now using images from the Colonial Office Photographic Library to try and improve English Wikipedia's pretty ropey coverage of the African continent, that collaboration didn't even require me to transfer the files. I can say for once, because the one thing we can all agree on is that working with open data and uh, social media also can be a very time-consuming area. This was the easiest project I've ever done because all I did was agree that a group of users could work in the way that they wanted to work, and that was all. It was much harder to run um, the This Means War project, which is a project that we did to digitize uh, Second World War war art from our collections, not because the Wikimedians were difficult, but because of the anxiety within my own institution. Another thing about Wikipedia is it's a place where two different things are going on. There are kind of two coal faces at which people are working and where we can make a difference, I think. Obviously, there's improving the encyclopedia, the reference work that every student on the planet uses, the reference work that we will be mad to ignore because it's everyone's first port of call for everything. But Wikipedia is also big data. And if you zoom out as projects like Wikidata and others are now doing, interesting digital humanities work becomes possible. And to facilitate this, there's fantastic work going on, for example, to attach authority data um, from VIAF, devised, of course, by the, um, the Deutsche Nationalbibliothek, the German National Library, um, to move that into Wikipedia. And that's now been applied to over 65,000 articles. That's an incredibly useful and powerful set of data. But where's our voice and our collection in there if we don't open up? Or for that matter, in any digital humanities work? And that's how an increasing number of academics want to do their history now. Well, maybe they'll go and do their research in someone else's collections. Let me give you two examples chosen not at all at random. Um, in 2008, our, our JISC-funded project, so JISC is the Joint Information Systems Committee, us who are a funding body in the UK, um, they funded a project to digitize a large number of British cabinet papers. And um, this site covers all the meetings of the cabinet from 1915 up to, at the moment, I think, 1981. And there's a lot of political and economic and most other kinds of history in those 65 or so years. But a key difference to some of our other online projects is that access to these papers is free and it's the collection's open under the open government license, the UK open government license. And when that's the case, even though the, as a website, cabinet papers is pretty painful to use, all sorts of things become possible, some planned and some quite unexpected. So in 2010, I decided to tweet the Second World War in real time using those cabinet papers and that generated a lot of interest and over 11,000 followers, which is nice, but it's the effect that that has on people thinking about the past and about original documents and about what we do that's the really interesting thing. Because the thing about social media, of course, is that you can see people's reactions while they're having them. And people's reactions were quite extreme. One follower wrote, I take about a microsecond to realize UK War Cabinet's tweets aren't actually happening. Causes several stomach-churning micro-crises a day. Now, it's not a shock to us that our collections are interesting, but it is a surprise, it can be a surprise to people online. And because it's a, a revelation that's just occurring to them, they want to share it. And they become, for 140 characters, advocates 
for your institution. And they use words like exciting, fascinating, powerful, astounding, terrifying. You know, when was the last time someone was terrified in your reading room? You don't have to answer that. But last month we had someone turn up with no trousers. In fact, the website Museum Next did a survey, and it turns out that more than 35% of museum Twitter followers actually say that one of the main reasons they followed the museum in the first place was to help promote it. And Museum Next also asked people, what should museums use Twitter for? People answered, to tell background stories, to have a conversation, ignite enthusiasm. But my favorite just said, no idea. Not marketing, that's for sure. And my point is not necessarily to say, rush out and join Twitter, although seriously, if you haven't already, rush out and join Twitter. Um, but to point out that Twitter is a place where talking happens and where it's easy to make you and your collections part of the conversation. Why are we, why are we working online at all, after all? The challenge we've set ourselves is how to get documents out of here, and indeed here, and into you know, everywhere, classrooms, homes, railway carriages. And perhaps you have people in your organization telling you, you know, we need to get into apps. What we need is an app. And maybe you do need to get into apps. But, uh, you know, a simulation like UK War Cabinet is an app. If by app we mean thing that people play with on their iPhones. People read it on the move. They write about it on the move. We're doing the mobile web just by using this service. And it was free, and people passed the content around freely. There are other benefits to this approach of open content and using public spaces. This is the Cabinet Rooms blog. And this blog has got nothing to do with the National Archives in the sense of um, any of the content coming from us. It's written by somebody who just decided that he would write about interesting things in the Cabinet papers. And he's covered the Olympics, gay rights, 1920s communism, and I've learned a lot, never mind his readers. It's the unexpected consequences of open data that are the best ones. And we can wait for these things to happen or we can try and shake things up a bit. Now, hack days and hackathons were sort of mentioned earlier. Can put your put your hand up if you don't know what a hackathon is. Oh great, we're going to be we're going to be done really quickly. Well, I'll, for, for anyone who, for anyone who doesn't know, it's not an event where people spend their time trying to break into the Pentagon. It's about spending a weekend sitting down with web developers and trying to build cool stuff with, in this case, cultural data. And some people say, you know, oh, hack days are a bit last year. Well, it was, it was new to us this year. And the thing about hack days anyway is that they're fun. They should be fun. If they're not fun, you're doing it wrong. And programmers, you know, having fun, that doesn't get old. It's traditional for these events to run over the course of 24 hours. So we did have people sleeping in our reading rooms all night. That did alarm some of my colleagues. But I was in bed by midnight, so I didn't see a problem. Um, so you can see on the screen the kind of the sea of laptops in our reading rooms, and there are some people under the age of 55 in that picture, which is always nice. Um, what people did over the course of the weekend was they put record series onto maps, they produced whizzy animations of medieval correspondence, but the winner was this website. Now, I didn't talk to the team that built this at any point over the weekend. A lot of them were ex um, BBC people. That isn't why I didn't talk to them. It just, it just didn't happen. They, they seized on the cabinet papers material as open and accessible, and so they, they, they built this site. Firstly, they used my UK War Cabinet tweets to download about 1,000 cabinet papers off of our server overnight. Then they used term extraction to arrange them by the places, people, and institutions that they referred to. Um, Wikipedia, more open data, provided contextual information about those entities, and the War Cabinet tweets give more contextual information about the contents of the documents, and there's catalog data um, from our Discovery API, uh, which is also open, uh, is in there as well. So basically what the team did, if I can get fractionally technical for a second, was to they express the data semantically so that every entity, Winston Churchill, Cologne, the Ministry of Information has its own page showing the relevant papers. And it's very interesting for us to see our records expressed in that way. And let me emphasize, the whole site was put together in a weekend by volunteers. And if you're interested in that, all the, all the data and all the hacks from that weekend are available on our lab's website. We'd spent a very large sum of money building an API for our catalog. 
but this was the first time that anybody had thought it might be a good idea to explain to people why and how it worked. Now, all that to me is quite a small beginning, but it's the sort of stuff that we should be helping to foster around our content. In small ways, those were successes. What's the alternative to all that? It's a bit unfair, but I'm going to pick on someone. I saw two weeks ago the announcement that the Churchill Archive in Cambridge has been digitized and is now available online in its entirety, strictly to institutions, for a fee. Now, that's great for a few hundred academic subscribers, but for the rest of us, it is literally worse than useless. And I say that because not only do I, as an ordinary UK or European EU citizen, still not have access to the content of those papers, which I'm told are the holy grail of 20th century archives, but now I know that they're not going to be made truly open for a very long time. And if you tell me that a specific collection is the holy grail of archives, and then you tell me that actually I'm not allowed to look at it, well, frankly, you pissed me off. We need to find investors who will pay us to unlock what others would pay us to close up. And we need to be careful, we need to be so careful, because we've all watched successive cultural industries, music, film, publishing, go to war with their own audiences in a counterproductive effort to protect out-of-date business models, which no longer have the consent of those audiences. And that's immensely costly in financial terms, and it's even more costly in reputational terms. Those businesses were stupid. We're not stupid, and we've got a choice. We can either get real about open content, or we too can begin to alienate our audiences. Or who wants to be the first museum to treat their visitors like a litigious media conglomerate? Now, in fact, in the UK, the answer to that question is the National Portrait Gallery, and it didn't get them very far. This change has already happened. I don't believe it can be fought, and it won't be stopped. If we don't work with our audience, they may well carry on without us. We allow, at the National Archives, we allow photography in our reading rooms, and in theory, that means users could digitize our collections out from under us. And it would serve us right if they did, because that would show that we'd failed to meet their needs very comprehensively. But actually, I think that's a process we ought to be encouraging. It's obvious that an archive or a library will never digitize its holdings without our users' help. And in fact, of course, if, if, we're, if we're being honest, they already do a big chunk of our cataloging for us. And of course, that's crowdsourcing. We use volunteers and have done for a long time um, to do our cataloging. So let's not pretend that crowdsourcing is something different from what we've all been doing with our friends' organizations for a very long time. We've all got friends' organizations. Well, you know, think of the crowd as the friends you never knew you had. The difference is that our anxiety levels seem to rise with the scale. So suddenly, the more friends we've got, the more, the more nervous we become. So here's a, here's a small and unthreatening example of what I hope the future might look like. This is Marine Lives. It's a project to produce an academically respectable digital edition of a volume from our High Court of Admiralty records. And these are records relating to disputes with a kind of a nautical, a sea flavor. And they contain a large number of salty sea dogs from the 16th century onwards and give a lot of insight into maritime trade and also into sailors' habits of getting drunk and then fighting or stealing parts of their own cargo and generally misbehaving. They're very interesting records. And in fact, the National Archives of the Netherlands has been working with them for a number of years. But the difference with Marine Lives is that this is an entirely user-led project. The project director, Colin Greenstreet, came to our hack day in the spring. And because we seemed enthusiastic and open to collaboration, he put together a team to transcribe 1,400 pages of these records and to mark them up semantically as XML so that data analysis can be run on them. It's not exactly a crowdsourcing project. It's more like distributed transcription because this crowd of academics, family historians, graduates, and a few school students is not very large. It's a team of about 35 or so. It's a, it's a big research group, if you like. But the point is that they're managing and organizing and training each other, and they're working on a project that they themselves originated, not something that we put in front of them. They selected which records to work with, and they produced their own document scans. 
they selected the platform for their transcription, which is uh, Scripto, the, the free and open source tool Scripto. And they'll decide if the project expands next year, as I hope it will, what further records to work on and how such a project could be financed. Now, you might ask, should we let users determine our priority? Well, I, I would argue that, that yes, we should. But, but even if you don't agree with me, we can run these projects in addition to our current ones because we're not really running them. We're just allowing them to happen. And there are a number of huge advantages. We haven't had to build some expensive new platform to hold information because we're using an existing open one. And I hope in the future we can go even further to develop and extend platforms like Scripto, Wikisource, and others, because we already have huge experience that we could bring to bear to improve those pieces of software. And why would we start from scratch when we don't need to? The National Archives didn't write my word processing software. I don't see that it needs to write my transcription software either. But rewrite it, that might be a sensible investment. And I also think that this sort of project might possibly solve the sustainability problem that you can get with some kinds of outreach. Those relationships can crumble and fall apart because they're artificial. When the engagement comes from the other side, maybe it's more lasting. And as for the openness, it's not just some sort of add-on. It's one of the main reasons why many of the academics and researchers who are participating were attracted to the project in the first place. And it also solves a lot of tricky problems around the project's outcomes. With an open model, neither the archives nor the researchers have to fight over who owns which bits of the project. Each has the same access to the outputs of the other as everybody else. So we've all got the scans, we've all got the transcription, we've all got the markup, and it's very hard to see how that project could work in any other way. Um, here's a non-National Archives example. This is spacelog.org, which is, I, I think, a beautifully presented um, searchable, uh, their searchable linked transcripts from key NASA missions of the 1960s. It's an amazing resource. What did it cost NASA? Nothing. It was built by a team of enthusiasts from the UK in one week in November 2010. And we've already heard today, um, you know, almost the pinnacle of this is... Um, this Google Art project that has just come from enthusiastic users at Google. If you've ever made the mistake of thinking of your online audience as just eyeballs, and I've done that because I used to work with Flickr a lot, so it was kind of a, a, an easy mistake to make, w then you know, we need to think again. But brilliant and enthusiastic developers are not an unlimited resource, and if we want to work with them, we've got to hustle because why should people work with us rather than on something else? You know, maybe because we're famous. I can tell you maybe that works for the British Museum, but at the National Archives, you know, we've got to work at it. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through our collections. It always come, comes back to our collections. It always, it always will, because they're the most interesting thing about us. Of course they are. When people understand what's here within our institutions, it's incredibly exciting for them. They can't do that unless we explain it to them. We haven't spent much time doing that. We need to inspire people to understand why our collections are important and to make them care about them as much as we do. But we need to do more than that. We need to work to put those tools in the hands of ordinary people, not just technologists. Otherwise, these tools are very self-indulgent. There are many different kinds of online collaboration, and the people working on these projects might be undergraduate historians, who at the moment, frankly, barely ever look at original documents. They might be the archivists and curators of the future. If they're just a bunch of techies, well, that's fine, too. We went for an audience, we found one. But we should be able to empower non-technical users as well to produce and inspire new expertise. And in the end, we reach a place where our online offering, our, our websites, they're not an offering at all. They're not the bad sweater that your auntie knitted and that you're vaguely embarrassed to wear or not where, those sites become a reflection of our users. They're made by them, and they're made for them. And I want to come to a finish, or a vague finish, back in outer space. And some people might say, that's where I've been uh, for the whole talk, but anyway. Let's, let's finish the story. Did the team from Surrey manage to make contact with Prospero? 
did ET, as it were, phone home? I'm sorry to say the answer is no. As yet, Mullard have not managed to resume contact with the satellite, and they've suggested that one of the reasons for this might be that the instruments that they were using were housed in a cereal box covered in tin foil. And that's not even a joke, but they say they've now got a metal box and they're going to try again. And the reason I mention it is to make the point that these things don't always go well. I hear that the Bundesarchiv no longer feels very positive about their collaboration with, with, with Wikipedia, and I'm sorry about that. That's a cautionary lesson to all of us. It tells us to do it differently and to have different expectations. It shouldn't tell us that working with Wikipedia is a bad thing, any more than if a new museum opens behind schedule, we might think that's a reason not to open any more museums. And the same thing goes for crowdsourcing. If your crowdsourcing project performs badly, consider, should we blame the crowd or should we blame ourselves? Of course, based on what I've said before, it amounts to the same thing. We have to be open about failure so that we can all learn from it. Uh, but we also have to be open, I think, about success. Old Weather is the most successful English language archival crowdsourcing project I'm aware of. It's worked through well over a million pages of transcription of ship's logs from, from the collections of the National Archives. And the project has collected 1.6 million weather readings with an accuracy rate using three passes on each page. So each, each page is looked at by three different uh, users of about 97%. And the project team claims that this level of accuracy is slightly higher than the early 20th century sailors who took the readings in the first place. And I particularly love the interface. It's a very clever and engaging piece of design. In fact, it's dangerously addictive. So if you're prone to this sort of thing, don't, don't go there. Just look at the slide. Don't visit the site, or you'll be transcribing ship's logs for a very long time. Do be careful. What impact has this website had on the National Archives? Almost none. I thought it should have changed everything. It launched in 2010. Perhaps by 2014, we'll have some sort of follow-up project. We were not involved closely enough to learn the lessons of this project and to understand in the detail that we need to why it works so well and to get the full benefits of its success. That's a problem. But none of these issues and problems raised, that, certainly that I've heard uh, today and from what I read on Twitter yesterday, constitute a reason not to start talking. No one ever replies unless we reach out. And I think Old Weather, which is part of um, Zooniverse, it's a, a collection of what are called citizen science projects, also shows we stand much more success when we work with existing online communities. And it's certainly the least demanding way of working um, on open projects to work with the existing community rather than going to a lot of time and effort to build a new one. But we need to beware. We, we must play by the rules of these communities and we must remember that they can bite if they don't like the way that we're behaving. Museums and similar institutions are used to being seen as warm and cuddly and in all other ways a good thing. And so it might come as a nasty surprise to realize that to open data enthusiasts, some of us might be the baddies. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard their institution booed at a conference. I have, and it's not very pleasant. And that's what will increasingly happen if we hang on to data that we shouldn't. And that's assuming we're not forced to open up by the European Union. But why should it take the tin opener of legislation to crack open this stuff? We should want to do it so that we don't miss out on the web traffic and enthusiasm and interest, the desire to work with us and the desire to fund us. Or instead, we could decide to be seen as unpleasant, domineering and technologically backward. In 1850, when the British House of Commons debated the idea of public libraries, which they saw on the continent, and they, uh, local councils were not allowed to have them uh, in Britain, so they, they had a debate about it in Parliament. Some MPs were horrified to realize that the strongest political opposition to public libraries came from the members of parliament who represented university constituencies. And the Salford MP, Joseph Brotherton, said this, it is a melancholy thing to find the members of the universities of learning 
taking a foremost position in this opposition to the spread of knowledge, did those gentlemen and their constituents imagine that no one except themselves was to know anything? While we provide vastly improved physical access to our collections than we did decades ago, online we risk turning into hoarders, grasping misers of information. And collaboration does mean less control. You know, there's no way to kind of paper over that. And that means that we, and particular, particularly senior management, who worry about these things more than the rest of us, that's what they're paid to do, they will need to relax their grip a little bit because we can't lumber these bright and enthusiastic new users with our bureaucracy. We can't afford to because they will push off and do something else and they'll take their time and money and interests with them. So you should ask yourselves, who in your organisation is best placed to bridge the gap between those inside with collections knowledge and those outside with technical knowledge? Well, since you're here, I nominate you to, have these, <laughs> to start having these conversations. Um, if you do that, there will be all sorts of people telling you uh, that this is very difficult, and they get paid to do that. You know, the copyright officer gets paid to worry about copyright. The business department gets paid to worry about revenue. And you can get paid to tell them to stuff it and that they have to make it work. And they will, because all of these barriers have been overcome in organizations of all sizes, big and small. And those other departments will never balance the scales for you, the scales that we saw in an earlier presentation, because they won't tell you what your organization is losing by not doing these projects. You know, all of their arguments are along one side. The internet is for talking. I really believe that. But when we start talking, and I mean really talking, not just kind of using marketing speak and communicating messages, people will ask us for things. And that's why open data is so important, because we can't meet our users' needs and wants without it. We need to put the tools in people's hands when they ask for them. And we need to redouble our efforts to explain to everyone else why they should be interested in this stuff. We need to be much clearer um, about how that can be done and what can be done with our content. There's not enough clarity online about how our collections can be reused. We need to explain to everybody how they can get involved and to lower the barriers to their involvement. And we've been hesitating on the doorstep of all this stuff for far too long. And I think it's time to take a deep breath, collect up our data and boldly go not out into empty space, but in, uh, into an online world of talking and making and doing. And that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. The online world of uh, making and doing I guess there are a lot of questions uh, t about this very ambitious, uh, very uh, 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 enthusiastic speech. Uh, I've stunned everyone into oh silence. God. Everybody <laughs> is convinced. <laughs> no. Thank you very much for the talk, because I was using the National Archives quite frequently back in queue. And um, I have a question which is remotely related to what you said in, in the talk, so excuse me for doing that. But um, I wondered whether, given the institution being an archive, putting certain stuff online, of course, hides the vast vaults not being digitized. And thus users keep forgetting that there is a physical archive behind that's actually getting less and less accessible because, you know, opening hours getting limited, shortened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Policies make, policy makers jump onto the train and say, wonderful, everything is digitized. Let's close the archive now for the public. And I wonder whether we do have any answers to that question, which is extremely remotely related to what you said. But still, I'm kind of, you know, wondering whether you do have any comments on that. Well, I'm delighted to say that we're nowhere near digitizing these collections. I, I was astonished to see um, some of those slides earlier um, 
in the presentation about Europeana, um, the proportion of our collection that's digitized, even though massive amounts of records have been put online, is very, very small. And the fact is, a very large proportion of our collections have not even been adequately catalogued. So when people say, oh, we've got 10% of our archive online, they don't know that. They've got no idea how many documents they hold, if they're being honest. Um, so I, 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 obviously this is not an inexhaustible resource, but it is a very, very, very large one. And uh, you know, a lot of this stuff will be solved by, I think, better cataloging. Um, rather than it presenting a problem in terms of, oh, you need to, well, maybe you don't need to come to the archives anymore. You're going to need to come to the archives for a long time. That, that's not a threat. Okay. Any more questions? You, you convinced everybody, <laughs> I mean. Uh. I, I'd like to, perhaps I'll just say something about, um, I saw something, it was just talking about cataloging. There was this fantastic phrase that I saw online yesterday, this, this heilig, heiligus coo of this, the sacred cow of the catalog. Um, and uh, th this kind of concern that um, no one wanted to uh, mess with this, this kind of sacred data. And I should probably say that the, the discovery um, system that we're working on at the moment, that we're, we're releasing new updates to very regularly, is designed to take user content and put it alongside um, the content that's been provided by generations of archivists. And the way in which we do that without um, giving everybody in the building some sort of heart uh, problem is that those two things will be kept separate. So they'll, they'll both be there. You'll see your archival catalog description that you've always seen, and then alongside, and very clearly marked, you know, with some sort of biohazard sign, um, that, you know, that there's user data alongside here. So in theory, we should get the best of both worlds, and everybody's happy. And certainly in my organization, everybody's very comfortable with that, with that idea. Barbara Fischer. You were very convincing in, in your speech. Thank you for that. Um, what, what I wonder, or many from us wonder here in the room, might be that, OK, we put everything outside there, and then by miracle, people will come and find new ways to um, use that data. Do you think you, do you feel you would have to stimulate that? And if you feel that, how would you do that? Oh, no, God, yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, in a way, that's what I... Uh, it, it, no, I mean, that. otherwise, that smacks of that dreadful um, Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. If you, if you build it, they will come. Um, you know, we, kn we know from work... You know, we've all been working online a long time. We know that's not true. Um, no, that, uh, t t I think that's where the work comes in, as I, as I was saying. You know, we, we have to go out, we have to find these people, we have to inspire them, we have to spend a lot of time trying to bridge the... One of the most, I, I, I think one of the most difficult things is trying to find language that will help technologists understand about our collections, because they don't know anything about them, why should they? Um, and simultaneously trying to explain to archivists who don't necessarily know very much about technology, um, what, what some of the possibilities are. Because until you have to you know, sort of move both, both sides together in that way, it's kind of inching along. Because otherwise, the archivists can't even imagine what they don't even know what they want. They can't even imagine what a system would be like that might be helpful to them, because they've never, naturally enough, they've never seen one. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of kind of talking required, but I do think that the, f the you know the, f the first kind of requirement is to cliche, but it's, it's to be open when people come to you and say, oh, you know, interested in doing this, and you're like, yes, please come in, you know, um, and not say, well, we might have some issues around copyright with that. You know, we need to we we need to get out there and solve those problems. That's what we need to be spending the time and, and effort doing. Uh, Kreuzer. 
And do you think that these, um, this vision could work out also in, in um, language spaces, which are much smaller than the English one is, like in German, <laughs> for example, because a lot of people are worried about that crowdsourcing won't work up very, very well. Um, when you got a very small language, because you can address only a small number of people comparatively. Um, in English, you might address a billion people all over the world, but in German, it's only 150 million. And uh, the smaller the mass it's, it's is... It's a very tiny number, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the smaller the mass is, the bigger the problem to incentivize, um, um, let's say, a critical mass. I, th I think that one of the things that people need to understand about uh, crowdsourcing is that there's a, there's a line. Um, there are, at one end, you have projects where you're trying to ask a very large number of people to do very small things. And old weather is based on that principle. So the barriers to entry are very, very low. The tasks are very simple. You try and get a very large number of people to do you know, one page. And then at the other end, you have projects where you ask people to do a lot more work. You ask a small number of people to do very large work units. And then it is a matter of finding the right people. The problem comes when people try and mix those two things together. They take a project that, frankly, is not very interesting, and they say, you know, why didn't two million people turn up to do my project? And you're like, well, you know, you, you asked them to do the wrong things. Um, so that's not a, for me, that's not a problem with the model, but it is, you do have to think, okay, you know, how, 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 how easy can I make this for people? You know, if I need people to be doing an awful lot of work, then I need to understand that you know, there might only be 50 people. And that's, but that's, and that's fine, but as long as the project is set up to run like that. Ich sehe keine Hände mehr und gehe davon aus, alle wollen nicht mehr hier weiter diskutieren, sondern in der Kaffeepause, das kenne ich ja schon. Ich denke, eine halbe Stunde machen wir und fangen eine Viertelstunde früher an mit der Podiumsdiskussion.